All right. Well, good morning. Uh, so this morning, as you likely have figured it out from the slide behind me, we're, we're continuing in our sermon series that we've called Faith Works. And it's a sermon series we're doing through the book of James, which uh, I love this book. I think it's been a fantastic book so far to study and to dig, dig and dive really into uh, as we kind of uh, proceed. Uh, so this morning we're going to be looking at James chapter 3. We'll be in verses 13 through 18. So usually when it's just a handful of verses, that means there's probably a whole lot there, and you'll soon find out there really is. Uh, so if you have your devices or your Bibles, now would be a great time to jump right into that. I teased a moment ago about this, this idea that sometimes my in-the-bag messages are better than my sermons. That happened to me, I think, just before we opened up this series. I did a, a fun little exercise with the kids during the in-the-bag, and it was probably one of the best games ever created for kids called This or That. You guys remember that? As a matter of fact, I, I quite literally probably got more positive feedback on that in-the-bag message than I did on my sermon that day. Um, so as you can probably tell, my ego is just sky high, right? So I, I got a lot, you know, of feedback on that versus uh, the feedback on the sermon. And um, one of the, the things that we talked about there was just making choices. And, uh, and we'll kind of see that a little bit today as we dive into this, this passage. We'll see that there's going to be a choice that each and every one of us have to make in life. Now, those choices we did with the kids, there were choices of, hey, do you like red or blue? Or do you like dogs or cats? And there was one rebel kid who chose cats over dogs. And those are, are fairly irrelevant, right? If you really think about it in the big scheme of our lives, particularly when we look at eternity, those are pretty insignificant choices we have to make. But as you can probably see and, and you can probably tell from where I'm heading with this, we have a lot bigger decisions that we need to make in our lives. You know, just, just adulthood in, in itself, but really when we look at the big scheme of things and eternity, we know that there are big choices that we have to make. So we're going to talk about that this morning. And one of the neat things about the book of James, as hopefully you've seen so far too, is James in this book is a very active book. James talks a lot about acting out our faith. And this is one of the reasons why Pastor Pat and I decided to put this kind of following the Proverbs uh, sermon series we did because we felt that there was a lot of similarity between the two. And as we've seen, and we'll see a little bit later too, there's actually a lot of similarities with the book of James and on the Sermon of the Mount that we find in Matthew 5 through 7. So uh, we're going to take a look at all that this morning. So if, uh, if you want to follow along, please do so. Uh, the... Uh, the passage will be on the screen and, of course, in front of you as well if you have your device open. We'll start at verse 13 and read through verse 18. Verse 13 reads, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have better, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So that's the passage we're looking at. There's a lot there. We'll unpack it. But I want to kind of pause for a moment, and if you think about it, and, and as we look at this passage, it's not very complex. It's not very complicated on the surface. And if you look even closer, you'll probably get a decent idea of what this passage is all about. So take a quick look at it again. Figure out, let me know out loud if, if you can kind of figure out what's the main theme of this passage. Not everybody at once. Wisdom. Right In this short passage, wisdom is, or wise or wisdom, right, a form of that word is used four times. That's a lot in a small pa uh, passage. So I think we have a good idea already of what this passage is going to be about. So the letter of James, as we talked about, is this great, great follow-up to the book of Proverbs. And way back when we started the book of Proverbs, we identified and defined that term wisdom. And this is how we did that. We just defined it this way. God-enabled skill for living. 
And this is important because when we look at this deeper, so the Greek word for wisdom is used here, but it's going to be a little bit different than what the Hebrew meaning of it is. And, and that's when, when we dig deeper and understand this book and the author particularly, we have to realize that James was Jewish, and he had a Hebrew culture and a Hebrew mindset. So when James is writing about this idea of wisdom, we have to recognize that he's really understanding this from, from a skill point of view. Because in the West, our point of view is, is it's knowledge. When we think about wisdom, it's knowledge-based. The Hebrew mindset is about skill. And maybe more specifically, how we live out that knowledge that we've received. And that's kind of what, what, what uh, James is talking about here. Um, and we see that in this book, and we'll see that all throughout. And if you really think about it, James has already done this a lot in his epistle or his, his letter. I like to say epistle, but it's, not, it's a very old word. It, it's something that he's already been teaching us how to live out our faith, and he's talked about this, and we've talked about it quite often already in this series. Last week, Pastor Pat did a really good job on kind of breaking down all of these, these skills that we've seen already and this wisdom that's been broken down, and particularly the maturity of this disciple and how we become mature according to James. So real quickly, I want to talk through those. We saw last week that um, when we open up this series, this, this, this maturity that disciples are to have, it starts with our trials. It starts with being tested through our trials. And then from there, what we've seen is it, it, we have these victories over temptation. And then we saw that it, it, the wisdom comes from maturity, comes from our intentions and how we go about doing the word of God. And we also saw that we, in chapter 2, when we opened up that chapter, we talked about how we need to be treating everybody equally and with love. And then finally, uh, with, you know, we test out our faith by doing good works. So we've seen all these things. And then last week, we talked about the matter of the tongue and how our words and, uh, can, can really do much, much damage or much good, depending on how we use that tongue. And, and what's interesting about this passage, when you look closely at it too, is it's verse 13, that you in verse 13 is tied directly into that you in verse 1. So he's still on this idea of the tongue, and he's still on this idea of how we're to live out our faith in a wise manner. So he's talking about that there. So really what he's doing, he's doing a couple things in this chapter. He's one, he's saying that we need to rely on God to tame our tongues. And then what we'll see today is we need to rely on God with wisdom and with that godly wisdom. So the main idea, like I said earlier, it's not a complicated passage. So the main idea, you've probably already guessed it and filled in the blanks, which is great. The main idea is this, a mature disciple seeks wisdom from God. A mature disciple seeks wisdom from God. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about these two contrary types of wisdom that this passage develops. And we're going to talk about these two types of wisdom, and we're going to answer a couple questions along the way. First question we're going to do is we're going to ask, what does this look like? So there's a wisdom. What does this wisdom look like? Second question we'll answer is, what is its result? So we know what it looks like. What does it produce? What's the result of that type of wisdom? And then finally, we'll close with just a couple of steps to living wisely that we'll develop directly from this passage. So with that in mind, let's talk about this first type of wisdom. And this first type of wisdom is worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. I'm going to try not to say that more than once because it is a tongue twister. So worldly wisdom is the first concept there. So what does this look like? I think what we need to do is go back and understand what the sources is and what the sources are of this type of wisdom. And the source of this type of wisdom is really focused around three things. First thing we see is it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and demonic. So that's how the ESV renders this uh, particular uh, passage here in this verse. If you have a different translation, it, you know, unspiritual might actually read something like uh, sensual. Um, it, the, the word demonic in the ESV might be rendered differently in other translations as of the devil or in the devil or a devil, right? So it's going to be a little bit differences, but overall, the idea is the same. So uh, I think what we need to do is understand why is this, a, a, why is this dangerous? 
right? And I think most of us in this room understand that concept, but I really love uh, John's epistle or John's, one of John's letters. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 kind of develops this idea of worldliness. So I want to go there real quick and kind of talk about what John says about it. So John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 reads this way. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So John kind of helps us, I think, to understand what that looks like and what the danger is there. So the danger is that it's not of God. The danger is it's not of God. And the term earthly that we see here, and and it it talks about this idea of a natural state, you know, and and some literal translations, it might tell you it's like animal type instincts. It's this natural animal type instinct that we have. It's, It's that state, as you know, that's separated from God. So when we're seeking that worldly wisdom, that earthly wisdom, we're just completely separated from the Lord. So now that we understand what that source of it is, um, let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. So the, the passage tells us that this looks really in two different ways. It says it looks, it's jealousy and selfish ambition. So in jealousy and selfish ambition, that's what it looks like. Now the, uh, the world, the world influences us, and what it does is it influences us and it drives you and I to us. Right? It drives us to us. It's a selfish in exterior, right? Where all we're doing is we're focusing on self. And that's really what he's talking about that. God's wisdom, as we'll see a little bit later in the second type of wisdom, God's wisdom drives us to him. And it drives us to, him, us to others. So it's a complete shift on where our focus lies. We've talked about this before, you know, but think about times where you may have been jealous about somebody. Maybe, maybe somebody got a new job and they're making a lot more money, or maybe somebody got a new car, maybe somebody uh, got a promotion at work, or, or whatever it might be. And sometimes, let's face it, we get kind of like, Ugh, another victory for Joe, huh? Right? And sometimes I think we have a tendency of doing that. You know, so how many of us maybe in that same breath have said, you know what, God, I've been faithful. I pray every day. I go to church every week. I'm a good dude. How come... Joe's getting all. How come he's getting everything? What about me? I'm sure each of us have been guilty of that at least once or twice. I want to quickly just kind of take a quick sidebar. Uh, Verse 14, if you really look at it closely, verse 14 is actually a command. James gives us a command in verse 14. He says, if you have bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, here's the command, do not boast and be false to the truth. So he's warning, and remember, he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians. So he's he's addressing things that are happening in that community, in that 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 body of believers. So there's somebody in that body of believers that is acting out of jealousy, bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition, and he's warning against those things. I don't usually look at the message translation. It's a paraphrased Bible. If you're not familiar, Eugene Patterson did some work on that. I don't usually look at that too often, but every once in a while they have some good stuff in there. Um, and they did a good job rendering this verse, and that's verse 14. The, uh, Patterson says it this way. He says, mean spirit and ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. That's really, I think he did a good job in paraphrasing that verse because that's really what he's talking about. People talking about things to make themselves look wise and they're not wise. And unfortunately, if our eyes are not focused on Jesus, we can easily be, easily be led astray. And that's what he's warning us about. So we understand what it looked like. So what does that produce? What is its result? And, and it's it's pretty simple here, too. It's just a couple words here that we'll talk through, and it's, it's disorder, and the second word is evil. It produces disorder and evil. And uh, what we see here, you know, verse 16, 
talks through this a little bit, and it's really that latter part of verse 16. And if you think about it, I've met a whole lot of people in my life, as, as, as have you. Think about some of those individuals in your life that you've met, that their lives just, just they seem like they're completely out of control. They're out of control. They're, they're always busy. They're always late. There's always something happening in their life. There's always that drama, right? And sometimes we read about it on social media. Other times we hear about it in the break room or we hear about it on a phone call. We've all met those individuals that their lives are completely out of control. And I'd be honest, and I'd be, maybe, maybe I'm just reading into things, but I would say that those individuals are likely not seeking the wisdom of God in their lives, because even when li- our lives are chaotic, if we're seeking the wisdom of God, generally speaking, just like the passage that, that Susan read earlier from, from Romans 8, it tells us that he's still in control. And when we let go of that control and we allow him to control, that allows that chaos to turn into peace or joy. That's why we, we read even here in James and in other letters, you've got to be joyful even under trials, tribulation, and we see that often in the New Testament. But I do think that this verse talks more about and less about this busy, out-of-control individual because what we see here is this idea here, it produces evil. And that's the scary part that we have to see. That term that we see in, in ESV, every vile practice, could really just be immediately translated literally evil. And that's what it produces here. It leads to evil. It leads to chaos. One of my favorite things I've learned over the past several years is in the creation account, one of the things we read about from from God and how he created things, we can really read that, that section of scripture to understand that God turned disorder or chaos into order. He turned disorder into order, and that's what we see when we're living under him. And here, here, here's what we have to, to get from that. He's already done that for some of us, and he is able to do that. When we try to create order out of disorder in our own power and within our own might, it doesn't always turn out so great. So God can do that to you and I, and, and I suspect that he's already done that for many of us as well. Psalm 19 helps us to see that too. He says this, Psalm 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God has the power to make wise the simple. We'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So we see that it is, there's a choice that needs to be made. And, and what does this passage tell us? Is It tells us that it's the law of the Lord. So we can translate that to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord directs us. The word of the Lord helps us to see these things and helps us to be wise. And so when we lose sight of that, what do we begin to do? We begin to rely on our own knowledge, our own understanding, or unfortunately those things of the world that can really get us sideways. And if you think about the world and its influences, what did Jesus say about this world? Who did he say was in charge of this world? Satan. He said himself that Satan was the prince of this world, and that's what we have to see when we're comparing the two. So it's a matter of choice. Spoke about this earlier. It's a matter of choice. We have to make a decision to follow after God's wisdom, even when it might be difficult versus following after the wisdom of man and of this world. So we've seen that first type of wisdom, that worldly wisdom. So let's talk about this other one, this positive aspect of what we see here from James, and that's, of course, godly wisdom. Godly wisdom. So let's talk through that. So I think we've got to go back to verse uh, 13. James clearly marks the foundation of this of this thing, okay? He marks the foundation of wisdom. He says that it's in good conduct and meekness. Good conduct and meekness helps us to see that. So uh, what we can do, it, it, and again, we see another command from, from James here. We see another command. This idea of wisdom is, is, as one commentator put it, it's the capacity to live life as it ought to be lived. It's the capacity to live life as it ought to be lived. It's the application, 
and the practice of our faith. So what does that look like? First thing, and it's real quick, and it's a simple one, is in verse, uh, well, it's actually, it's a list. We'll go through a long list of, of things that it produces, and it starts in verse 17 with pure. Okay, so that's the first thing that it produces, and, and notice how he says first, first pure. That has to, it, it's primary. That idea of first is it's, it's of most importance. It's primary. It has to start there. It starts there because God is pure. If God is pure, then we are seeking after his pure wisdom. That, that's a designation we see there. Purity begets purity. And that's what we need to see here as well. So our lives... And we've seen this in the scriptures, need to be blameless and righteous and just before God and man. And that's impossible with, God, with earthly wisdom, as we saw already. Second thing we see here is it has to be peaceable. Peaceable. So again, remember, we're, we're looking at this from the, the verbiage and the translation from the ESV. So there's a lot of different translations, and they have a lot of different words used here. Um, but th- this is... Uh, this is the ESV that we're looking at here. So uh, recall earlier we talked about James and his Hebrew mindset. And his Hebrew mindset, there's, there's going to be a specific purpose in his usage of the word peace, right? So if we're looking at it from a Hebrew mindset, then he, he is likely referring to this idea and concept of shalom, that Hebrew idea of peace. And again, that Hebrew idea of peace is going to be a little bit different. It's a, it's a state of mind that satisfies, that is satisfied and has relationships which are characterized by harmony. So that's, that's one simple uh, explanation that I received this week on, on this idea. So I'm going to say it again because I butchered it a little bit. It's a state of mind that is satisfied and has relationships which are categorized by harmony. So think about your own relationships, Think about your, your marriage. Think about your relationship with your children. Think about your relationship with your grandchildren or those who are close to you, your work relationships. Are they characterized by harmony? Are they, are they living out this idea of being satisfied? Are you satisfied and living out harmony with these people that you deal with most often? So we see what we do, and, and, and as we go through this list, you'll see that there's a lot of it that's very personal and very relational, and I think James does that on purpose. Next thing we see here is that it's gentle, gentle. The great Puritan preacher Jonathan Edwards said, gentleness may well be called the Christian spirit. It is the distinguishing deposition in the hearts of Christians to be identified as Christians. All who are truly godly have a gentle spirit in them. So this idea of gentleness, we talked about this just a couple weeks ago, or actually just last week, didn't we? About being taming the tongue. That's really a lot of what we're talking about there. So I won't touch on this too much because Pat talked about it a lot last week. But again, are we gentle in the manner that we're dealing with others? Are we gentle in our dealings with others? Next thing we see is we need to be open to reason open to reason, right? I think immediately our minds go to social media or dealings with, with others from different, you know, different side of the fence. And I think that's, that's a reasonable place to go. But this phrase, it actually alludes to this idea of obedience and agreeableness. And it talks about this idea of being compliant and, and teachable and be willing to be persuaded, and to be willing to yield to one another. That's, that's the concept here that James is talking about. And when you break it down like that, it becomes more and more difficult when you're dealing with somebody or dealing with the, with the government official and, and things that are affecting us in our world and our culture today. But that's why James says we need to stick to the word of God and we need to stick to him and seek after his wisdom because otherwise we're going to be in a muddy puddle. So this idea here says we need to be, you know, open to, you know, being reasonable with others. And that's not, a diff- that's not an easy thing to do. And I tell you what, what that does is it requires a humble heart and a humble attitude. And again, that's not always easy either. Next thing here you see here is, is full of mercy and good fruits. He puts this phrase together, full of mercy and good fruits. So this idea of mercy could refer to as compassion, 
or even in this context, empathetic, having empathy with somebody else. So there's a little bit of uh, 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 different aspects that we can take from this. So, but again, I think it's really important that we notice that James puts this together, full of mercy and good fruits. It's this idea that we saw back in chapter 2 when James says it's better than to, to do something than to say something, right? Better to do, and James talked about that then. It's the, the evidence, it's the doing of our faith that really shows if we are truly disciples of Jesus. Next thing we see is it's impartial. It's impartial. So this idea of impartial, hopefully it sounds familiar. We saw this back in chapter 2. And uh, this is obviously kind of that, that other side of the coin, right? The other side of the coin here where James here is really saying that the true and mature dif- di- Christian is not divisive. It's something that says that they tend not to stir up friction in a group. Again, it's really difficult to do that. How, how hard is it to not respond to somebody who says something foolish or who says something that we don't agree with? It's really hard. But again, think about it in the context of the church. We are to be unified as a church body. Pastor Pat a couple weeks ago talked about uh, Ephesians chapter 4. That's a great book that, or a great chapter that helps us to understand what that unity looks like within the church and within the body. And that's really what we're talking about. Somebody who does not stir up f- friction within a group. And that's what he's talking about there. They have this idea and this mindset of unity and agreeableness. And again, is this true in your relationships? Is this true in your relationships? I don't know about you, but I've met people, people even in my own family, that they always have to be right. They always have to be right. They always have to be the last one to get a word in. You know, you're leaving the room and they just say one more thing just to get the last word in. You ever met anybody like that? That's what we're talking about here. They just need to speak to try to exude their own wisdom. And sometimes it's not always a good thing to respond to that. Finally, John, uh, uh, James says that we need to be sincere. And you saw that again in verse 17. So this literally means to be without hypocrisy. And remember the idea of hypocrisy, it's a, it's a play actor. It's somebody who puts on a mask. And, and that's where that word hypocrisy comes from. Yeah, and it's the complete opposite of what we read earlier in verse 14, isn't it? It's being bitterly jealous, which is what we saw in verse 14, bitterly jealous and acting with selfish ambitions. It's the complete opposite of that. Uh, and, and what we see here is when we are, are following this idea of bitterness and selfish ambition, what does it do? It, 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 it turns into insincere dialogue, insincere thoughts, insincere speech. I was an HR leader and representative and manager for 20-something years. And you can probably imagine how many people like this I met and dealt with over that period of time. I dealt with a lot of insincere people who are angels when they sit in your office, but then they leave that office and they're making their employees' lives incredibly difficult. You ever met anybody like that? Those are marks of people who follow after the worldly wisdom, who, who take the, the steps and the shortcuts of the world versus the steps and the wisdom from God, which might take a little bit of extra time to get there. Maybe you won't get that promotion because you decided to do the right thing. And we see that often, in, particularly in the business world. So these are the characteristics of godly wisdom as we see spelled out in verse 17. And, and this wisdom, and this is what that, that wisdom from above looks like. So let's talk about what the result is of that. The result is spelled out for us in verse 18, and it's peace. It's this idea of peace. This idea of peace, and if you look closely, verse 16 and 18 are polar opposites. There's a strong contrast there. Verse 14, we saw, uh, or 16, we saw disorder and evil. Verse 18, we see peace and righteousness. So James is clearly indicating what this, this, these two types of wisdoms are and their complete opposites. Specifically in verse 14, what we see is that picture again of the farmer, one who sows peace. And what does that, that peace produce? It produces righteousness. So you're 
you know, laying down seeds of peace, and that produces righteousness. And that's what, what James is talking about here. So we've seen that mature disciple seeks wisdom from God. Mature disciple seeks that wisdom from God and from above. I almost used from above and from below instead of worldly and godly wisdom, but that just didn't flow very well. So uh, this is where we landed. So what, we, what we've seen so far in this series, there's a lot of callbacks to James's half-brother Jesus and his teachings, particularly when we look at the Sermon on the Mount. So I don't think it would be a sermon in this series without taking a look at some of those comparisons. Uh, so I want to pull some of those things out a little bit um, and, and, and kind of see how this relates directly to Jesus' teaching. First example we see is from verse 13 where James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let, his, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And that directly correlates to Matthew 5.5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What about James uh, 3.17, but the wisdom we just read, went through this list is pure, then peaceable and gentle and open to reason, full of mercy, impartial, good fruit, uh, mer- full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Matthew 5.7-8 reads, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And just uh, one more example is James 3.18. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Matthew 5.9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We are called to be peacemakers and, and drive unity, not to argue and to bicker and complain and all those things. And my goodness, it's difficult. So I told you earlier that those are the the two types of wisdom. So I want to at least give you a little bit of something to kind of take home with you. Um, So uh, here are a couple things. This is not an exclusive list, of course. There are two steps that I wanted to share with you of living wisely. First thing we see here is to be obedient in God's word. To be obedient in God's word. So we've seen already that this idea of biblical wisdom is more than accumulating knowledge about the Bible and about God. There's a lot of theologians out there, particularly in liberal universities, who do not believe in God. But rather, it's about being obedient to what we know. And hopefully this sounds familiar, because we did talk about this a couple weeks ago. John chapter 14, 21 says that whoever, this is from Jesus, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And it is he who loves me that will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So we've seen this already, that when we're obedient to the word of God, which is the source of God's wisdom, then as we we just saw again, we we saw this, that it results in this growth in our maturity as Jesus followers. And it results in the maturity of your relationships with God and man. I came across a quote this week from a gentleman by the name, he's a pastor, professor, author, Grant Richeson. And he said that wisdom is the ability to look at things from God's viewpoint. Wisdom is the ability to look at things from God's viewpoint. And just based off of what we just looked at and based off of that quote, we can discern and deduct that we are going to seek that wisdom from God, from his word. And that's what we need to be doing here. Uh, another, Another quote that I came across is James Adamson. He says that the first step in genuine wisdom is to know God. We can't get godly wisdom without knowing God, so we have to go to the scriptures to find out. And Jesus himself did that, didn't he? If you were here during Easter, you, uh, you know, we went through Luke chapter 24, and one of the sermons was on the, uh, the road to Emmaus, uh, Emmaus Road passage, and it was a wonderful passage, and we learned um, that that these two individuals encountered the, the real Jesus, and that's how their faith was strong and made strong. It wasn't through hearing. It was, a ma- it was a matter of encountering Jesus, and I think that's what the sermon title was. But the story, if you're not familiar with it, is that these two disciples, after the resurrection and after Jesus was gone, they didn't see the risen Christ, so they went back home. So they, they got on this road, and they began to leave, and they began to go home. They were sad, they were disappointed that Jesus was not there. 
And Jesus went to them. Jesus went to them. What's going on, guys? You good? And then the scripture says this, and this is one of my favorite verses. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all that the scriptures, all in the, yeah, interpreted in them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus himself went back to the book of Moses and the prophets, and he shared with them all that they needed to know that pointed to him. And we read that their hearts burned and their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus and they were comforted. And that's what we see there. So the first thing we need to do is be obedient to God's word. And then finally, the second thing is we need to have a humble heart before God and man. We talked about that a little bit earlier. We have to have a humble heart before God and man. Humility and this idea of humility is found in that word meekness that we saw earlier. It's found in that, that idea of meekness we saw earlier. And again, it's directly attached and associated with this idea of wisdom. And, and being agreeable and being able to be learned and able to be teachable. And this idea of this heart is, is what we saw in verse 14 with this earthly wisdom uh, is produced. Um, so we see that we need to have a humble heart before God and before man. Um, again, we talked about the Proverbs earlier. And, and I think this is a great verse that helps us to see this. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. So we see this idea how the humble humility, a humble heart and, and attitude before God and man is a mark of godly wisdom. I want to share with you one last biblical example. You know, frankly, these are just a couple of steps. I told you it's not an exclusive list. But here's another example of, of seeking godly wisdom. And it's from the, the, the account that hopefully is familiar to most of us of, of Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3, we see that God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he told him, what is it that you want? And what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom for the purpose of, of leading and, and serving the people of God. Right? So he, he, he wanted to, to have this wisdom from the Lord because he knew his own wisdom wasn't going to be enough. So the Lord was pleased with this request, and what did he do? He gave him more wisdom than anybody from before and following him. He was the wisest man. So Solomon didn't have to go and hit the books. He didn't have to go to seminary. He didn't have to go and find the wisest man on earth. He gained his wisdom from God. God was the giver of wisdom. So that's why we have to see him. Earlier we saw this idea from Psalms 19 that God can make the wise or the simple wise. No, don't quote me. I'm not calling you simple. But I'll gladly take that designation of simple if that means God can make this guy wise. And God can and God has with most of us in this room. So we, we talked earlier about this idea that we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice of either following after the things of this world and this worldly wisdom or to follow after the things of God and this godly wisdom. That's the choice that we all need to make at some point in our lives. And sometimes that's, you know, situational. Other times it's, it's a large aspect of our life. So again, maybe to put it in simple terms. Today, do you choose to seek self or do you choose to seek God? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, God, for your word that is full of wisdom, that is full of incredible things that we need to understand completely and, and wholly in our lives. So help us to develop the desire to seek after godly wisdom and the discernment to push away the things of this world that might distract us from seeking after your wisdom. And I think that's probably one of the hardest things that we have to deal with today is this idea that there are a, a lot of sources of information out there. And your word teaches us that we need to almost consider the source in a way. And we need to make sure that whatever we look at and whatever we try to employ in our lives aligns with the word of God. So help us to do that. Help us to know your word so we can know you better.
And we ask that in Jesus' name.